Stephen, thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. I mean, you guys founded Invest Tech Bank before I was even born. So I'd like you and I'd really appreciate it if you can just take us back to that time. How did it all begin? So I wasn't actually a first phase founder. It was my colleague Ian Kent and his two colleagues, Errol Grauman and Larry Nested. I joined part time in 1978. So they were founded basically in 1976. I joined part time in 1978. Uh, and uh, Bernard and I joined about a similar time, but full time I joined in July 1980. And then we had eight people, and we used to all sit around one table uh, um, and fight with each other. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were very acquisitive in your yeah. beginning, and I guess I see why a boutique fund management company would need to expand its reach and its goal. Would you say that was a good way of growing back at the time? And were time simpler, were markets simpler? Uh, so <coughs> you had very dominant players. Uh, in those days, you know, and uh, South Africa was a very staid type of corporate community. Mm -hmm. So the way we could grow was to make acquisitions and uh, to build out our franchise. So in our early days, we, we grew our acquisition. And uh, in 1985, um, we merged with a company called Medport, which is an old traditional trust company mm -hmm. that managed money and lent money against property and uh, it was a, a, a difficult merger and eventually Investec became the dominant force because we were young and cheeky. Uh, the Investec people dominated the merger and that's where you know we started managing money for private clients and uh, we listed in 1986 and our mm -hmm. share actually one of the few shares that went, went up a little bit but really went down on the listing because people questioned how we were ever going to compete and uh, and then came the early 90s um, we started making you know more acquisitions mm -hmm. we always used to buy finance books mm -hmm. but then we bought a company it was a banking group at four what they call discount houses and they went broke we bought them in I think 91 in 92 mm -hmm. uh, very quickly over a weekend we bought them uh, and then we bought a bank in London in 92. And it was very interesting. When we bought the bank, it was... We agreed Allied Trust. Allied Trust Bank. It was the deal was agreed in s February 92. And the sellers, which were Barclays, said that we have to wait for the referendum. Because if it's a no vote, and South Africa is not going to transition to a democracy, mm -hmm. we're not selling to you. And uh, I always say, you know, that we as South Africans were all liberated from apartheid because Investec, although we were a bunch of whiteies in those days, we were able to expand our horizons globally. We went from a country that was the pariah of society to someone that was welcomed by the world. So we all benefited. And even if you read Madiba's book, Second Last Paragraph, he always talks about my role was not only to liberate the oppressed, but also to liberate the oppressor. And really I often quote that book because it really change things for for us and we were then able to go out and build what is now a recognized international business well that's something that he said about you on the screen right now there's a quote here the company which stands head and shoulders above its peers not merely because of its phenomenal growth or its sound management of assets but because it is a trend setter Who said that's that? what he said nelson yeah, no, he was a good guy. He's I full used of to find me. He used to find yeah. me. But you've, you, I mean, you've he used to find me and <laughs> say to me, Steve, I need you go to go with me to the trans guy. He was president. Uh -huh. And I used to go to him with the trans guy, and he had GT Ferreira, who was the founders of. Um, what do you do when someone like Nelson Mandela calls you and you have a busy day? You cancel everything. Okay. Yeah, you, after what he did for our country, you cancel everything. And we, we went on Air Force One. And we arrived in uh, near his village, and he would take Mr. Ferreira to a hill and said, Mr. Ferreira, I want you to build a school here. And Mr. Ferreira would say, yes. And he'd say, but don't worry about the furniture, I'll get it from the Labner brothers. He knew all of us. <laughs> then he'd take me, and he'd have 500 women sitting there with blankets. He said, Steve, you've got to help these women. And we gave, we gave them an uh, investment in one of our properties. You know, we're American embassies, we own that corner. And they became a 5% shelter in that property. So I hope they made money from it. <laughs> but that's what he used to do. He used to take Brian Joffe and say, Mr. Joffe, I want buses. Uh, and that's how he used to engage with us as corporates. And, and it was like very, you, you would never say no to him. 
Right now, we're going through a, a change, a transition in, in political leadership yeah. here in South Africa. We need a president right now that can get the private sector to do such things, to create jobs, to build schools here, to build hospitals yeah. there. What was it about Mandela's character that the new leader, be it Cyril Ramaphosa, who could uh, take yeah. the reins, can take from that in order to get more support from the private sector? He was, he was engaging. He didn't talk down at you. He didn't throw darts at you. He engaged with you, and he got the best out of you because for what he did for our country, no one could say no to him. And I think we have that opportunity right now. We saw that DeVos, um, with Cyril as the leader of the delegation, talking to the South African delegation at dinner with international investors there and you know, talking in a unifying way. Not shouting at, you know, you white monopoly capital, you this, you that. Actually pulling us together as South Africa Inc. and saying, we need to grow our country. We need to uplift people from poverty. We need to reduce inequality. We're going to do this in the following way. So, you know, I'm co-chair of a project called YES, which is going to try and get a million interns over three years. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a tough target. We need all the corporates on site and we need a, a strong level of commitment. And that was, you know, Cyril originally spoke about that as a potential project. And, you know, we embraced it and we will drive it. And then when Prabhan was fired, we thought, oh my God, what are we going to do now? We've got no one driving the agenda for us. Mm -hmm. And it was so important, the dialogue that Prabhan brought back, mm -hmm. you know, post Nenigate. And then we lost it. Mm -hmm. And that's why Cyril can really make a massive difference by engaging, because he understands labor. He understands business, he understands government, and he understands the international community. Mm. What more can you have? Stephen, I'd just like to, to come in there and say, well, first, it's, it's actually surprising that you're resigning before the current president of the republic. <laughs> uh, but you've seen a lot of presidents in your time. You yes. know, you lived, you were in business when, you know, PW made the Rubicon speech. You were in business when Nelson Mandela was released. You were in business at the height of the greatest volatility self-created by President Jacob Zuma by firing Tlantanene. What has doing business in South Africa throughout all that noise taught you? It taught me to cope with, firstly, ambiguity, cope with volatility and navigate bumps in the road. Because that's why, you know, we could manage the financial crisis in the UK uh, better than most UK banks were able to do it because we'd learned to deal with volatility and how we take risk mm -hmm. and how we protect ourselves from risk and how we fund ourselves all having always having a lot of cash so you know uh, PW Berta was 84 or 85 I can't remember the exact mm -hmm. date we then had a, a mini financial crisis mm -hmm. South Africa Inc only because we had a run on South Africa the money went and uh, some of the South African banks had to be bailed out. I think Nedbank had to be bailed out by Old Mutual at the time. Um, that's how Old Mutual got such a big percentage in Nedbank. Mm. And you couldn't get any money from anywhere. So, so those were very, very difficult times. And they created a two-tier RAND, a financial RAND and a commercial RAND. And then they had a thing called debt standstill RAND. So if you look at South Africa's rating, there sits a D mm -hmm. behind the rating. Because that says we're a country that's defaulted historically. It was that PW Berta mm -hmm. moment when everyone thought we were going to cross a Rubicon because mm -hmm. uh, Pip Berta had run around the whole world mm -hmm. telling South Africa is going to change and then this guy started pointing his finger at all of us. <laughs> <laughs> all so deratings <laughs> and downgrades and nothing unfamiliar to you but you know Stephen we are running out of time I mean I could have you here yeah. forever but uh, let's just uh, wrap this up. You are being replaced by two CEOs so uh, too many to do your job. No, I, I, so if you look at our structure We've had a CEO, me, and an MD, Bernard. We worked as partners. Bernard lives in London. I live in Johannesburg. And uh, it's a complex business. And I think that the fact that we have Bernard on the ground in London, I was just happened to be CEO before we went to London. Um, or I was MD before we went to London, and Bernard was Chief Operating Officer. But we just kept that structure. But we always worked as partners. We've got Hendrik de Toy, built our asset management business from 200 million rand to over 105 billion pounds under management. That's a big number. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was worthy of a seat at the table. And then Fani Titi, who's been an excellent chairman of ours, one of our me board members rated him as the best chairman ever for the Investec Group. And he came on as a very young man, okay? Ve a lot of knowledge. He spent 50% of his time with the group. 
and he understands the banking side, he understands the people. You know, if you phone Hendrik to tour and you say, Hendrik, where are you? I said, he'll say, I'm in Montevideo. I say, what are you doing in Montevideo? <laughs> That's in Uruguay. He say, no, no, we've got clients here. Then you find him say, where are you? Now I'm traveling from Beijing to Singapore. You know, we are active and you need sure. more than one hand. We run a complex business. You need people on the ground to build relationships with the communities as well as with your clients. And we think sure. that it is a very well workable structure. We have joint CEOs of our banking division. <coughs> uh, so we have lots of these joint appointments in our group and we always have. Stephen, quick one. How would you like to be remembered? Uh, Stephen from Benoni. <laughs>